speaker this evening, who is uh, Eugenio Piagini. Um, Eugenio is a professor of modern and contemporary history at Sydney Sussex College at the University of Cambridge. That was my way for you to say in England. Um, <laughs> uh, he is an alumnus of the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, from which he held, moved on to help hold fellowships and lectureships at Churchill College, Cambridge, uh, at Newcastle University, at Princeton and at Robinson College, Cambridge, before the uh, uh, creation of his own personal uh, current chair in 2011. His research uh, focuses on the social, economic, and political history of democracy, um, with five book-length monographs and counting to date on topics ranging from popular liberalism in Victorian Britain to the enigmatic figure of William Ewart Gladstone, uh, and the Italian Risorgimento, uh, um, and up to and including, um, in terms of his Irish work, uh, recently published uh, work on Irish Home Rule uh, movement and its impact in both Irish and British uh, political life. That was British Democracy and Irish Nationalism, uh, 1876 to 1906, published in Cambridge University Press. He's also published a survey of Irish history uh, in 2014, and he has been the editor um, or co-editor of no less than five, as a really major collections, amongst them beginning with the landmark and field-defining volume Currents of Radicalism, together with Alistair Reid back in 1991, uh, right up to the more recent, and I, I think no less ambitious and far-sighted for our field, the Cambridge Social History of Ireland since 1740, which he co-edited with Mary Daly and which was published in 2017 and indeed continues to be an extremely valuable resource for teaching and, and for, for scholarship and thinking about the social history of Ireland. Um, of course, in addition to all of these monographs and edited collections, uh, Professor Biagini is also the sole author of well over 30 scholarly essays and articles which have appeared in many prestigious journals and booklets. As the founder of the Modern Irish History Seminar at Cambridge University, where I must say I was privileged to uh, be part of um, while I was one of Eugenio's doctoral students myself at Cambridge, um, as well as via his prodigious scholarship in the field of modern Irish history, I would say it's very fair to say that nobody has done more to promote uh, the study of Irish modern Irish history at Cambridge than Eugenio and very few have done more than him to promote it across the history profession in Great Britain, um, particularly over the past decade and a half. This evening, uh, we have the pleasure to hear Professor Biagini speak about his latest book project, uh, which examines the role of minorities in shaping post-imperial and indeed post-colonial polities across Europe in the 20th century in particular. So without further ado, I give you Professor Eugenio Biagini. Thank you, Pete. Very generous uh, as ever. And thank you, you all, for being here. Thank you for to Kelly Kenny for having invited me, and especially to Loretta, who is here among us this evening, and I'm really honored by your presence. The title of my paper uh, presents three uh, central words and concepts, minorities, democracy, and empire, between which there is, as I should argue, a constant tension and uh, especially in the period under discussion, this tension had dramatic and sometimes tragic developments. Democracy was largely, of course, about the nation state. The idea that the nation should be the natural environment for a democracy was axiomatic at the time. And they're talking especially the period after the First World War, or between before the war and up to the 1940s. The Democracy in the sense of the world was power to the demos, to the people. But who are the people? The assumption of the Romantics was that each territory would have, or each group would have its natural territory. It would be homogeneous and clear cut um, nations without gray areas, without overlap, and without conflicts. So this understanding of democracy and nation was democratic but not pluralist. On the other hand, most of Europe at the time consisted of empires. 
all of them were pluralistic but not democratic. The minorities were falling between two stools. Their aspirations were squeezed insofar as they were about democracy. They could not aspire, they could not have uh, a sphere within which exercising the um, aspiration to self self government would be politically possible. But they could survive quite well under the hierarchical system of empires within which homogeneity was not a requirement. In fact, it was taken for granted that the empire would encompass different ethnicities, many languages, different religions, <laughs> and the only requirement for political acceptance was, legit, was uh, loyalty to the ruling family or to the emperor or to the uh, hereditary of the state according to the various political arrangements we have across Europe. So basically, on the one hand, empires which are not democratic are pluralist. On the other hand, nation states which may be uh, democratic, but they are uh, not pluralist. And the outcome of this particular tension became clear in the aftermath of the First World War. When most of the European empires, with the partial exception of the British one, fell apart. And the falling apart made space politically speaking, and in many other ways, for the uh, establishment of nation states. But in just about every case, the borders or the boundaries between these ethnic groups, which were aspiring to become self-governing, became war zones. In some cases, this involved large-scale transfer of people. Millions of Greeks were forced to leave Anatolia, where they've been living for millennia. From the days of the, before the days of the Apostles, for example, and uh, millions of Turks were forced to leave Greece. And there were similar uh, conflicts um, between Romania and Hungary, between Hungary and Austria, and many others, not to mention between uh, Finland and Russia. And of course, the rise of communist Russia had a further dimension to this uh, tension. So the problem was effectively how precisely the, the dream of Woodrow Wilson of a, a, a state of a Europe, and in fact a world of self-governing, self uh, self-determination countries could ever be established. One of the success stories illustrates the problems and how the problem was compounded by the breaking up of the empires. This is Czechoslovakia, one of the most democratic interwar uh, republics which were established in the aftermath of the disintegration of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. Uh, the problem with Czechoslovakia is that not only was the name, as the name suggests, a compound between two major ethnicities, the Czechs and the Slovaks, but in fact each of the two parts of Czechoslovakia had large um, ethnic and linguistic minorities left over from the disintegrating empire, primarily from the Austrian Empire, there were Magyars um, aspired to join Hungary in the south, there were Ukrainians who would like to uh, create their own state, there was no Ukraine as such. There were, of course, the Sudeten Deutsch, Sudeten Germans, and they were to become the excuse for Hitler to start the Second World War. So minorities are incredibly controversial throughout the interwar period, Partly because there is this mismatch between the aspiration to democracy on the one hand, which is based on this claim that nation states are homogenous and that they should somehow uh, provide a voice and opportunity for, for people to speak their own voice in a distinct way under a, under a state uh, uh, which reflects their linguistic and religious and ethnic aspirations. That is the sort of ideal. And the reality, of course, is the messy uh, geography and the patchwork of uh, linguistic religious groups, all of them with different allegiances and further aspirations. So, for example, as I said already, Germans of uh, Czechoslovakia want to join um, Germany, but of course, there were other cases in which people wanted to declare their own independence. Now, and we are talking about Czechoslovakia. 
Czechoslovakia had a president, Tomasz Mazalik, who was actually a distinguished democrat and a political thinker as well. But among other people, he's also the one who indicated most starkly what were the conditions for toleration for a minority. And he says, the precondition for toleration is that minorities must be minimized. Now, of course, we are now already a long way from the ideals, uh, from the pluralism of the old empires or from the ideals of Woodrow Wilson. But what happens in the country which we are most concerned with this evening and in general in our profession? Ireland. Well, for one thing, Ireland, of course, had a rather simpler geography of minorities than other countries in Europe. They were primarily religious groups, uh, and they were Catholics, Protestants, and a few Jews. Few, but important in cultural terms. And Catholics would have represented a minority in uh, Northeast Ulster, Protestants a minority everywhere else. We are talking of substantial minorities. Uh, even in the South, uh, Protestants before partition represented about 10% of the population, well above the present day level. And Jews have been steadily growing in terms of numbers, uh, partly because of the persecution of Jewish people in uh, the territories of the Russian Empire starting from the 1880s, the various pogroms. So the situation in Ireland was on the one hand uh, apparently simpler, on the other hand was politically very complex. Partly because uh, Ireland had been traditionally the forefront of claiming democratic rights. Remember the extent to which uh, the, the foundation of the United States and the uh, early Republican movement uh, was uh, influenced by Protestant immigration from Ulster. And then, of course, the extent to which uh, republicanism had become so important for the Irish diaspora, especially after 1845. So effectively, these are not just ordinary minorities, are minorities which know how to organize themselves politically and know very well the language of democracy. And they understand now democracy as, as, as uh, expressed through the sovereignty of the people, as meaning the sovereignty of a certain group of people in a given region, for the home rulers, for the nationalists, this is sovereignty of Ireland as a whole. But in the north of Ireland, in Ulster, um, the unionist majority, local majority, claims that the sovereignty which they aspire to is the sovereignty of people like themselves over the counties of Ulster, at the time meaning nine counties. Now this picture is interesting because it provides uh, a visual image of the extent to which opposition to home rule. Home rule has become the polarizing, as you know, polarizing phenomenon, of a polarizing turning point in Irish history from 1886. In fact, the date is, is interesting because it further sort of um, confirms the argument which have been presented so far, that it is the rise of democracy which brings about a series of polarizations, the outcome of which can be disastrous uh, for as long as the claim is or the expectation is that there should be total homogeneity within a given democratic political entity. This was the claim at the time. So from 1885, the extension of the franchise to householders, irrespective of uh, property qualification, creates an electorate which is much larger than anything the Irish had known until then. It's less differential, and it is now provided with a legitimacy. They believe to be the democracy. They believe be the, the focus person, pocket man, in fact, of the man, for, for the entity which is supposed to be liberated in one way or the other. And in the case of Ulster, rather than having a national government, which to them means basically experiencing this sort of experience that Masaryk was to verbalize uh, uh, in 1918, it is being marginalized, being minimized in a predominantly Catholic state. Sooner than doing that, they were prepared to arm themselves 
and to resist by force the will of the British government. Things came to, came, things came to a head in 1916, as we know, when a similar movement, which had been brewing uh, since 1912, exploded in, in a, first of all, in the Easter Rising, and then in a, in a, in a war which continued until 1923 uh, with different developments, and the result of which was, of course, the proclamation of the Irish Free State, but also at the cost of some historians that describe the cleansing of the nation. Now, ethnic cleansing is uh, rightly uh, regarded as both uh, anachronistic as, a, as an expression and totally out of proportion to the extent of the violence which took place in, in Ireland in comparison with what I said already about, for example, Greece and Turkey. I mean, it is the, it is the age of the Armenian genocide. And obviously, it's nothing like that in Ireland by any stretch of the imagination. It is the age during which um, the, the, the borderline, the borders between Poland and Russia become bloodlands, become areas in which the number of people killed violently is, is countless. But within, you know, in, in relation to what Ireland had experienced, over the previous century, this was quite a shock. And Sean Keating, in this uh, allegory, allegories of change, captures the extent to which the outcome of the dream of national homogeneity had resulted in widespread destruction. And Keating himself represents, paints himself as this despondent patriot, uh, half dead. Uh, and there is a, an IRA volunteer and the National Army soldier in the, the grave of Ireland, while in the background, the big house of one of the Protestant landlords uh, lay in ruins. Basically, in the aftermath of the uh, civil war and of partition, there were only three options left to minorities, whether in the north or the south. Submission to the new order of things, the new system, Emigration or partition. This was the cost, the price to pay for this aspiration to national homogeneity within a democratic nation state. Submission, emigration, or partition. And of course, partition resulted in the creation of two democracies, and I shall say more but now and in answer to questions if you like, about the extent to which you can use the expression democracy for both Northern Ireland and the South in this period. And of course, each of the two countries claimed homogeneity and legitimacy. Infamously, James Craig claimed to have achieved a Protestant parliament and the Protestant people. But basically, Emma de Valera was saying something similar, more or less at the same time, the repeat references to Catholic Ireland and to the Roman Catholic Church and the state should work hand in hand. There was nothing strange at the time about this particular understanding of political legitimacy, but the consequences were disastrous. For one thing, the minority in the South, which is the main focus of my paper, declined dramatically. Not just between uh, 1911 and 1923, when it declined by something like 36, 36%, about 110,000 people left the country in this period of these, these years, but also continued to drop quite dramatically, as you can see, throughout the period down to the 1990s, when there was a, a, a reversal toward the number of Protestants, or in this case, the Church of Ireland people started to increase again. So effectively, they were made to feel uncomfortable, or they had no prospects, or they were feared the reprisals. There are many different explanations. But the result was that the South became more homogenous, diversity was sacrificed to this idea of what a nation should be like. Now, some of the people who left or were not comfortable were, of course, not comfortable for political reasons. The Anglo-Irish elite, as it was uh, frequently uh, referred to, and of course, when you say Anglo-Irish, you qualify the Irish with the claim that these people were not properly Irish, included um, the closest you can get to a British equivalent of the Juncker class 
in Imperial Germany. And this goes back from the days of Hugo Wellington throughout the 19th century, we celebrated the Imperial War warriors by Kitchener, to the uh, first, second world, first World War with Sir John French, and then the greatest leaders of the Second World War as far as the British forces were concerned, both of them southerners. The Montgomery's had a large country house to do actually in County Donegal, and the Alexander's country in, uh, again, south of the border in Cavan. So, of course, some of these people were more, more than British loyalists, but um, the minority which was weakened by this drive towards homogeneity included also much of the business elite. Uh, and of course, uh, these included, or had been for and remain, in fact, the present day iconic of Irishness. So it's, there is an irony here. The Guinness, for example, uh, is an establishment which was for centuries associated with one of the leading families uh, in the Church of Ireland, and still are uh, well represented with the Synod and uh, active in various charity. Um, at the time, the time of this discussion, they restored a private expense the roof of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, uh, around which, of course, there is the Ivy Estate, which is basically where the workers of the Venus breweries um, used to live. It also included other iconic characters, the intellectuals, W. B. Yeats, Shola Casey, Samuel Beckett, just some names, because they are more famous than others. And uh, while they flourished in a uh, pluralist Ireland, uh, the island of Ulysses, the island of James Joyce as well, who was not a Protestant but was another critic of uh, monocultural Ireland, they all felt in various degrees and to various extent uncomfortable after partition. The minority also included uh, champions of feminism. Charlotte Despard um, was then one of the many women nationalists who converted to Catholicism, she was actually the sister of Sir John French. So she was the sister of the general in the picture of the dead. And like uh, many other families, from the ascendancy, you have um, women becoming rebels and men becoming remaining sort of loyal to the state. But even after conversion, of course, she was rather uncomfortable with the outcome of um, of basically the Irish Free State, and so was Constance Markiewicz, despite being a uh, uh, leading revolutionary in 1916. A later generation saw Irish Murdoch, another Dublin Protestant, and a feminist, leaving Ireland and settling in England, where she <coughs> con conducted, she laid free the rest of her life. So what about the other religious minority in the South? Also iconic, partly thanks to James Joyce and his Ulysses, the number of uh, Jews in the 26 counties uh, was much smaller. And it, it, it grew dra dramatically in the, from the 1880s due to uh, the arrival of uh, persecuted Russians, or, or Litvaks as they were uh, called, because most of them came from present-day Lithuania. Um, remarkably, of course, there was a very little increase during the Second World War, so despite the uh, vicious and murderous persecution of Jews in continental Europe. Very few of them were allowed to settle in Ireland during this period, and this included mainly factory owners and people who came with skills, money, and investments. The, the numbers remain uh, minuscule, also in comparison with Northern Ireland, or especially with Britain, uh, where, of course, with the kinder transport and many other themes, much larger number of Jews were allowed to settle in. So why so few were let in? This was again the price to pay for the claim that nation states should be homogenous, and in particular the suspicion that um, Jews were somehow could not be uh, assimilated, they were somehow incompatible with Irishness. A claim of course which was strongly contested by many Republicans and radicals, but of course, nevertheless, for the majority seem to think. So where, where did the Jews settle? Traditionally Dublin, from as early, uh, at least from the 17th century, when they were allowed back into Ireland 
1656, but also in various uh, cities in the, in the north, Belfast being the most important, and in the south, famously Limerick, where there was a boycott in 1904, Waterford, and Cork. And these people encompassed a wide cross-section of society, more or less than Protestants, it should be said, Protestant at the, reputation, at the reputation of being consistently wealthy, but in fact it was a large uh, section of the Protestant community who would have lived more or less in the same condition, conditions as these um, tailors, um, like Italians in New York or many other immigrants in industrial cities, um, uh, Russian or Litvak uh, immigrants from Jewish communities across Europe, took up this profession because it was probably one which was more consistent with their pre-industrial skills and their uh, large supply of labor. But not all of them were or remained poor. But social mobility within the Jewish community was and less remained uh, very high. And this uh, wedding in Waterford in 1901 captures a key moment in the life of, uh, of a large family here, but a solidly middle class family. And further up in society, you had people like Sheila Beddington, who married in the early 1920s, the Honorable Melvin Wingfield, future Lord Housecourt, of course a member of the Andrew Irish uh, nobility, uh, and his Housecourt house uh, is, is worth visiting, as, as I'm sure most, many of you have visited already. So, um, it is remarkable, first of all, uh, that this wedding took place um, uh, full stop, but also took place not in the Church of Ireland, to which uh, powerful powers would belong, but in the registry office of Jerusalem. So why Jerusalem? Because powers could, or rather Mervyn Wingfield, was then serving as an officer of the Palestinian police force. And this brings us into another dimension, how the empire comes back as a consequence, partly, of this um, exclusivist understanding of what nations should be like. And the empire of which we're talking about is, of course, the British Empire. There was a close and long-standing uh, cooperation between the Jewish elites and the British Empire. I mentioned already 1656, that's, of course, when Cromwell uh, allowed Jews to come back. Uh, Jews were active in the, well, in the army of William of Orange uh, and then later on established themselves in Dublin, joining in large numbers um, the Freemasons from 1723, which became one of the, one of the foci of uh, community, uh, business community life, I should say, within which Protestants and, and, and Jews, and up to a point Catholics as well, could cooperate across religious bound, uh, barriers. During the war, Irish Jews were proud of their blood sacrifice, as people expressed themselves at the time. And the um, in memoriam here, this uh, list of photographs and uh, mugshots celebrate some of the uh, people who were killed from the Dublin community or from the Southern Irish community. This included, already by 1916, two Victoria Cross uh, awards. Uh, which is the, mark, the greatest uh, honor, of course, for uh, military decoration in the British Army. Furthermore, throughout the period of the Rising, the head of the civil service in Dublin was Sir Matthew Nathan, himself a Jew, very active in lo the local Jewish community. But without going through the detail, I should briefly refer to the third image on the screen. That is the Balfour Declaration, 1970, in which the British government um, uh, recognized or accepted the need to establish a national home for Jews in Palestine. In the aftermath of the war, you have more than that in terms of British Jews or uh, rising through the ranks of society, the um, commoner who uh, was uh, elevated to the highest uh, rank of nobility in one go was actually a Jew, uh, Rufus Isaac, who uh, was made the first Marquess of Reading 
Marcus comes just before Duke, and that is the high, second highest level of nobility, and was sent, of course, to become Viceroy of India, running at the jewel of the British Empire from 1921 to 26. Simultaneously, Herbert Samuel, Liberal Party leader in a few years, this gentleman here at the centre, was, uh, became High Commissioner for British Palestine. And this is an interesting picture which captures the variety of minorities with which he had to deal in Palestine. And in both cases, both for the Marcus of Reading and for Herbert Samuel, the idea was that because they were Jewish, they would be better able to understand diversity and deal with minorities. Of course, this work not, it did not work either in India or in uh, Palestine, but this was the ideology, and this was certainly the extent to which empires had to deal with diversity as a matter of course. So, what happens with the dissolution when we, we break the Ireland departing from the British Empire? Well, one interesting uh, consideration is the extent to which, um, at the time at any rate, imperialism went together with another set of ideas or ideals which we don't normally associate with imperialism nowadays, and that is internationalism, or indeed cosmopolitanism. And uh, the picture you have here is the issue of the Irish, um, of the Church of Ireland Gazette, which was the Church of Ireland uh, organ, and still is actually, a uh, weekly newspaper, and this was published in the Easter week. The Church of Ireland Gazette office uh, were located just behind the General Post Office. And the staff were surprised by the rising, and they were basically unable to leave the offices for one week. Uh, at the end of this week, they published the issue of the Church of Ireland Gazette, but the front page was not about the Easter rising. It was about fundraising for Armenian uh, uh, refugees and for the uh, persecuted people of Armenia, which is quite uh, remarkable. Um, uh, I suppose you can say uh, this was already typeset or whatever it is, but they had plenty of time to change it, and, and they didn't. And this is not an isolated case. Throughout the period of the revolution, Armenia and various other groups are constantly uh, in the focus of uh, fundraising uh, from the Church of Ireland. It is basically the idea that minorities should support one another across political divides. And this is because even before the dissolution of empires. This idea became even stronger once Ireland left the United Kingdom. Bolton Waller was at the time of the revolution a fairly young clergyman, but he came to, the to, to, to fame uh, in the, uh, during and in the aftermath of the war by publishing a series of short tracts and essays some of which uh, became incredibly influential. One uh, was adopted by the League of Nations as a, one of their official pamphlets, and others uh, won uh, prizes. And in each case, uh, it was basically Bolton Wallace, the Church of Ireland clergyman, presenting an alternative idea of Ireland. Hibernia, for example, the future of Ireland, um, was an attack against Irish Ireland, against the idea that Ireland should be Celtic claiming that the, the strength of Ireland was diversity, that for centuries the Irish had sort of been absorbing and receiving immigrants from all over Europe, from the Vikings, from the Huguenots, from Jew, persecuted Jews and what have you, and they should continue to do so. And it was a basic mistake to identify independence with homogeneity or nation building with uh, intolerance. The Church of Ireland Gazette adopted the League of Nations as a sort of uh, um, almost a teleological and uh, uh, embodiment of what the Kingdom of God might become. Of course, the, the, the League of Nations at the time, and indeed throughout the period in the interwar period, was a club of imperialist powers. And Susan Pedersen has expanded and analyzed in great detail the extent to which the League of Nations was to an extent a front for the continuation of the French and the British Empire. But there was no, 
no, no, from the point of view of the minorities, there was no contradiction whatsoever. Minorities had prospered under imperial systems, the League of Nations humanized empires, and empires in the interwar period were largely perceived, even in the United States, as agencies for world development. It is amusing to watch Hollywood films about the <coughs> Indian Raj or about uh, the Foreign Legion or something or other, producing the interwar period and see who are the heroes and who are the villains. And there is no doubt in the mind of Republican Americans that, of course, the empires were there for the benefit of mankind. But certainly minorities is felt like that. Frederick McNeese was the father of Louis McNeese, the poet. He was a bishop in the Church of Ireland. Um, and many other intellectuals were also from a, from a clerical background. And he was also a strong critic of, of nationalism intended as unilateral or isolationist um, uh, unwillingness to co cooperate with other countries. And instead, he presented as an alternative to nation building in the interwar meaning of the world presented this idea of a world unity in which nations and partners each making this contribution to the well-being of all, each helping and being held by all. Of course, it was a utopia, but it was a utopia which in the context, in the context of the rise of fascism, the context of the rise of uh, Nazis, but just before, a few years before the rise of Nazis. So obviously, it is a powerful protest against the spirit of the age which is going the other way and she's going towards dehumanizing increasingly society. So what about the Jews? But the remarkable thing which I found in my study is the extent to which uh, Irish Jews articulated very similar ideas. Um, both in terms of the preference for empires, of course they already expanded on the uh, affinity for the, for, for, for the British Empire, but also in same terms of the idea that the League of Nations or the British Empire, the proposition between the two uh, political entities is very interesting, offer the best option of survival for minorities in an age of nationalism. So nationalism, far from being, as I started to say at the beginning of the story, the expression of emancipation becomes explicitly by, even before Hitler right, uh, raised to, rose to power, uh, a threat to survival for some minorities. Herzog was, at the time, Isaac Herzog was the chief rabbi of Ireland. And these sermons are uh, particularly interesting from uh, the point of view of the politics of Judaism and the politics of minority. I will go to the extent to say that during these years, in the 1920s, uh, he inaugurated something like a theology of minority politics, or if you like, uh, the politics of minority status presented in theological terms, claiming on the one hand uh, that um, uh, the League of Nations was the embodiment, again, from a Jewish point of view, of uh, this uh, moral reformation of the human race. On the other hand, uh, hoping that there would be something like the uh, uh, utopian uh, reconciliation of the world through uh, the creation of a state of Israel. But in fact, it doesn't use the word expression, state of Israel. There is a, that is actually the reason why I said it's a theology. It presents Israel largely as a kingdom of priests. So this is before the Holocaust. And this is before the mass immigration of Jews to, to Palestine. It can be seen as a kingdom of priests, partly because Herzog is himself a uh, theologian and, uh, and the rabbi, and partly because the numbers are comparatively small. But certainly the, the whole idea is one which, in issue at any day, should be compatible with harmonious cooperation with the majority in, uh, in, uh, in Palestine. In one sermon he uses an expression in tantalizing similar to Winthrop's A City Upon a Hill. He calls uh, the, the, the Zionist settlements a city of Sinai. He basically says, they say, uh, as Winthrop is, will be the, you know, the, the, the new frontier, the, the paradise regained, and so on and so forth, um, in, in, a, in a context which would be perfectly compatible with peace and, and administration. In fact, he, he, he followed, he was consistent to what he said 
and in uh, 1936 he uh, resigned his position as chief of rabbi of Ireland uh, and he uh, accepted instead to become the chief of rabbi of the British Mandate of Palestine uh, where he served until his death in 1959 and of course from him a long dynasty of uh, Jewish politicians, Israeli politicians, including the present day president of Israel, uh, uh, has emerged. And, and I, I, I photographed this, uh, this, this poster is actually a bond from the Jewish Museum of Dublin, because again there is this idea uh, of, uh, which is so, so present in American sort of early fathers, founding fathers mythology, of a country which is virgin without political opposition, it is empty and it is open for men of goodwill to colonize and to turn into a fertile land of hope. And this hope vanished quite brutally in uh, August 1929 in the course of the massacres of Hebron, Hebron Darius. And the 33 Jews were massacred. This episode resonates very much with what happened in, in October a few weeks ago. It was basically, um, uh, from the point of view of the international media, an unprecedented barbarous attack on civilians, irrespective of sex, age, and whether or not were civilians or, or, or people in uniform. And the turning point in uh, Herzog's uh, rhetoric and the turning point in uh, Protestant attitudes to Israel is remarkable. This is an example. Just a few, uh, some time after the, the event, this is someone who had been reading the lessons in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And as he says, he was struck by the remarkable similarity between what had happened in the days of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was sent to re rebuild Jerusalem after uh, the first exile, and, um, and what happened was happening nowadays. And basically the British Empire was there once again with a providential purpose. From this point of view, from this article, in this particular document, not from the point of view of the Jews, although of course the great hero is Herbert Samuel, but from the point of view of uh, Christian Zionists. Christian Zionists espouse the case, a British and Irish Christian Zionists espouse the case of a, of, a, of a home for Jews in Palestine at this point in time and uh, remains faithful to it through the next generation. The empire was increasingly perceived as a police force serving in Palestine with something like a clean shaven Irishman like this one in the picture in the poster should be doing with pride and because by doing so, they were helping to bring about God's national plan for the world. And Britain, meaning the British Empire, was the servant nation, which had been chosen by the Almighty nonetheless to bring blessings to the world. In this case, the restoration of a uh, home for Jews. It is remarkable to compare and contrast what the uh, Protestant media said we got another uh, voice of this period um, presented as an alternative. Robert Briscoe was a distinguished uh, female foreign politician, became mayor, Lord Mayor of Dublin uh, later on. He was uh, a TD at this point in time. And uh, he was appointed by the Valera to find out what was going on in Palestine. And he started to study this issue, which up to then had been fairly remote from his interests, and came up. Uh, in a uh, correspondence with Herzog, who by then had moved to Jerusalem, with this idea, a federation of states consisting of the various Arab states with a, with a Jewish state divided with different parts uh, associated uh, in this federation. The remarkable thing is what Herzog answered. Now, Herzog has a reputation of being a, a, fin, a finifoil or a, a Sinn Féin even <laughs> rabbi because allegedly during the uh, revolution he supported the IRA and protected some of them and to a certain very good friendly terms with the Valera. But in the aftermath of the Hebrew massacres, 
and in the 1930s, he started to speak and to write like an Austrian Unionist. Basically, he says, the only hope for the Jewish minority in Israel is partition. You have to choose between submission, immigration, or partition. You cannot immigrate further because nobody wants us. We try to submit to the German state and many others and do the results. At this time we must make we must make a stand. So could democracy work for minorities in the interwar period? Before 1914, empires had been a safe, pluralist, and non democratic option for them. The problem with democracy as it became practiced, as it was implemented in the interwar period, was that it was not pluralist. It not only it predicated um, the unity or the homogeneity of, a, of the people forming a national state as an essential requirement, uh, they were prepared to put it into practice by various means, more or less violent. It is remarkable that in Palestine, similar problems to Europe and to Ireland in particular emerged very soon in the course of the 1920s. And the solutions were very similar. At first, there was democratic idealism, um, the idea that minority principles could best be defended as a matter of principle, what has of used to write in Ireland and what the various Church of Ireland and Protestant voices tended to say at the time and after, afterwards as well. But if idealist fails, a return to empire was a fallback position. Jewish loyalism in Palestine, Protestant Zionist versions of the same attitude. And the result is partition is a solution is seen as compatible with democracy because after all this is about the Zionist state, state is simply about creating locally a mirror image of what Ireland or Northern Ireland is trying to become uh, in, in Europe with result, results which were even more disastrous. Thank you. questions and answers now for Professor Biagini um, and we have a roving, roaming mic um, right there um, for questions. Guy? Uh, th thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks for that um, really interesting thought-provoking talk. I, um, I, I wanted to think of an example and ask you to, to, to address it, and instead I'll just, uh, I, was, I was rather going to think of an example and ask you to address it, but instead, failing to think of an example, I'm going to ask you to think of one. Um, and that is, are there, are there interwar figures, intellectuals or, other, or politicians or otherwise, who are um, speaking about democracy in terms of a, mad, like a kind of liberal proceduralism? That is, you, you presenting democracy um, in the way that it really seems predominant in the period, clearly, which is a kind of um, uh, uh, synonymous with or coterminous with the people. But are there alternative voices that are um, trying to legitimize democratic ideals, norms, or states through a kind of common allegiance to a set of laws or procedures which would make room for, um, and now they might not have followed through on this thought, but that kind of, that train of thought would have made room for the integration and protection of, of minorities within dem within even largely nationally organized democratic polities. So, yeah. are there such figures? Yeah, yeah, there are. Most democratic leaders are of this particular political inclination. In France, uh, is an example. Uh, Aristide Briand is the name that comes to mind. Britain is another one. And uh, but this doesn't mean that, of course, these countries don't have their own, their own forms of xenophobia and uh, racism and so on and so forth. Um, the United States is the third example. In fact, in Ireland, uh, De Valera was certainly, in my view, both a Democrat and a Republican. The problem is that if you had to deal with a democratic electorate, they're not master of your 
decisions. You must uh, propose solutions which are likely to win elections, and you must speak in a rhetoric which is likely to secure the return of your TDs at the next <coughs> election. So uh, the Valera was forced somehow to find a mid midway between uh, essentially a uh, religiously exclusivist, uh, monocultural uh, solution and the uh, aspiration he had to uh, toleration and pluralism within certain limits. And the limits are defined by the 1937 Constitution. Which is a great document in many ways. Think of the date, 1937, and the, the Nazi persecution against Jews is on the way, you know, on a major scale. But the Constitution recognizes Judaism as one of the religions of Ireland. But of course, Many Catholics were uh, extremely suspicious of Judaism. So despite the trend in public opinion, the Valera is able to somehow carve uh, a space for diversity and he held his ground against pressures from various directions. However, the same de Valera was the one who A resisted even a modicum influx of Jews. There is a, a, an occasion when this change, rather, is a, a series of letters sent to De Valera by Herzog. In one says, there are, the British have a, a large number of dentists and doctors, and um, in proportion to the population of Ireland, um, I think seven dentists could be let into the country, and they have the names, and uh, I wonder whether you could make an exception for seven dentists. He didn't get a reply, the seven dentists remain in Germany. So that is not because the Valera was set against dentists or Jews, but because he knew that there might be, there would be, an anti-Semitic reaction if he made, if he, if he was perceived to be soft on this particular front. For the same reason, he was prepared to, uh, of course, to be, uh, or at any rate, to tolerate a degree of uh, intolerance against Protestant community in certain, in certain. Context. And it said so. In 1935, when there were widespread riots in various parts of Ireland, the um, uh, Irish Free State government was very firm in deploying the Carta to protect the minorities against the most uh, extreme consequences of violence. Much more effective, it must be said, than the government of Stormont in protecting uh, Catholics during the, the riots of July 1935 which was the beginning of a particular series of acts of intolerance. So I'm not sure whether it's an answer to your question, but uh, just to recap, minorities are intolerant in this period because of the anti-immigrant, anti-diversity prejudice involving large cross-sections of society, which are not effectively counteracted because the spirit of the age is or presumes homogeneity as an essential definition of, of what a nation is supposed to be about. So, uh, thank you for that fascinating uh, talk. Uh, sort of on a similar line to Guy, kind of thinking about some of the other alternatives that were out there. Was there any interest among Irish Protestants or Irish Jews in the minority treaties uh, regime that the League of Nations had with that? Yeah, lots of interest. Yes. But no uh, desire to replicate them. Ah. Um, and this is because, well, for a number of reasons. First of all, they don't want to become conspicuous. And the attitude of the, mon uh, the southern minority is completely different from the northern Protestants, completely. Instead of confrontation, they want some form of cooperation. They want to, they are prepared to submit. Submission is the starting point. That is why they are in the South. Because we don't want to submit left. Um, what they try to do is to insist instead on the spirit of 1916, the spirit of the proclamation of the Republic, which is of course about toleration and equality before the law and so on. So every time they, are, they feel threatened, they say, I'm going back. Proclamation says, you know, this and the other. So this one, one dimension. The other dimension, they uh, imitate the Catholic Church 
and they try to enshrine to, to, to embed the institutions um, uh, within the law, particularly schools and charitable institutions. So that they will have the, the space or the safeguards for these particular spaces within which, as minorities, they can somehow survive. And of course, this is possible because the state in the Irish Free State is largely withdrawing from many responsibilities which before, before partition um, local authorities would have performed, particularly welfare. So after partition, many um, of the tasks in which uh, the poor law or other institutions, including school boards, would have performed are generally passed on to church-run uh, organizations. So the, the strategy uh, of the Protestants and the Jews is to say we want just like the Catholics to have our little spaces within which we can be ourselves. This, this technique has been described as um, pillarization in the case of the Netherlands and Belgium. And it's basically a non institutionalized form of pillarization. This, each community becomes like a pillar from the bottom to the top, within which you have a separate school system, a separate hospital system, a separate insurance system, and, and separate political representation, and what have you, um, separate sports clubs, uh, and in this way you, cope, you sort to of become compatible with the majority, but you are separate. For, if you like, a form of uh, voluntary apartheid. Hi. Um, thank you very much for that really very fascinating um, the obvious question that comes to mind for me is relates this to the current uh, to, to current current events and thinking through uh, the conflict in, in, in Israel and Gaza. Um, and the Irish government has been quite conspicuously supportive of the Free Palestine movement, the Palestine Solidarity movement, um, and in contrast, very much to Britain, of course. And uh, that, the way, well, the way in which that's generally framed is through the kind of common rhetoric of anti-imperialism, right? That, that these, these two causes share a kind of common anti-imperialist project. And I suppose I wonder what your analysis here and your reframing of this history offers in terms of understanding um, the context of the present. Well, I'm not sure I can uh, offer a distinct uh, new insight. The divide which you have uh, now summarized uh, takes shape within Ireland, Southern Ireland during the period which I discussed, well until the 1940s. We find Protestants solidly supporting Israel with, with voices and expressions and ideas like the ones um, which uh, I have um, reproduced on the slides. So effectively, um, Christian Zionism and the idea that the empire is a good thing and that the empire um, is there to promote civilization of which uh, Jews and Zionists are the uh, harbingers. Um, on the other hand, even within the southern Protestant community, 19, the 1940s independence of Israel in 1948 is a turning point. It's very interesting in this respect. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Protestants remain Zionist consistently throughout the period since independence. In the South, there is a clear cut divide. They say now Israel is independent, it's no longer under the uh, protection of the British Empire, and we're no longer somehow bound to any form of allegiance to what we used to believe in the past. The situation has changed. They don't become quite as uh, anti-imperialistic as other sections of society, but they, they, they certainly abandoned the British Empire much sooner than um, any, both, any other uh, group in the British Isles, and well, from, from, from as early as the 1940s. Really, after the end of the Indian Raj, they start thinking in terms of the European community. That is the single most important new development in the ideology of Southern Irish Cross. They are the first to espouse the idea that Ireland should join the European community very much in the, in the, from the beginning when Jean Monnet sets up his first call and, and Ireland 
agreement that the Irish Protestants start to, especially the Methodists, I start to say this is really what Ireland should be looking into. And again, the idea is the same. Basically, what is the idea? The nation indeed is isolation as, uh, as um, uh, Knis was, was writing, the nation in isolation is dangerous. There must be cooperation. So cooperation in the 1930s means the British Empire, the League of Nations. In the 1950s means the European Community, later on the European Union. And of course, throughout this period, there is a convergence between uh, the, the views of the minority, especially the Protestant minority in the, in the South, and the policies of the government. Why? Because Ireland is like a minority among nations. Ireland as a small country is vulnerable and they know to be vulnerable. So from the beginning, as soon as we were admitted in the League of Nations, um, De Valera in particular became a strong supporter of collective security. For the very same reason why the Irish minorities were supported this form of collective security. They, don't, they, they fear to be left on their own. They knew they would be vulnerable. They, was, they don't want to stand out. They need security in uh, numbers. Yes, thank you. Uh, so as, as I was listening to this, it struck me that uh, it was kind of surprising initially to hear empire as a safe place for pluralism, although I, I think I understand um, the, the way in which that functions. But it also struck me that uh, pluralism within democracy in uh, these places that end up being partitioned. So Ireland, Palestine, India, it seems like it might be another example. Um, pluralism is so impossible in part because of the, the centuries of imperial policy that deliberately exacerbated uh, tensions amongst different minority groups. And so I'm just wondering if, um, if this is particularly true across different styles of empire and different various European empires, if this is a particularly a, uh, a problem that finds itself playing out across former British holdings, um, or, or if we kind of look across different imperial powers, we would see similar problems based well, on the imperial uh, strategy. Thank you. Uh, so this is a very complex question, but to begin with, I don't agree that this uh, diversity, so this uh, interest we just stoked by imperial powers from the West, in fact, of course, well before the British arrived, there were empires in India. Mm -hmm. And the, the, if you go to Delhi, the Red Fort is a symbol of Muslim imperialism in India. And that is why, of course, the present government uh, is, so, uh, is so much under, uh, against Muslims. And they perceive the Muslims the same way as the, as the Irish Republicans perceive the British. And this goes back a long, a long time, well before. In fact, one of the reasons why the British succeeded was precisely the extent to which India was divided. And say, the same can be said of many other empires. The greatest imperial expansion in the uh, 18th century is the Chinese Empire in terms of square miles. And of course, the Russian Empire was another great success in terms of territorial expansion. From the end of the 19th century, when um, we had the rise of democracy, all these empires, at least the Russian Empire, certainly the Austrians, start thinking very seriously about minority and diversity. And so do the British in India. There is a book by Juliette Cadio about Russia. And it's quite remarkable, despite the reputation of the Russian Empire as being oppressive, it's quite remarkable how Russian bureaucrats were um, uh, asked to somehow devise uh, ways within which um, the many diverse ethnicities within the Russian Empire, the regions, and, and, and all the minorities you can think of, could somehow be incorporated within a harmonious um, system which would be pluralist but very hierarchical. So in, in this respect, there is actually a, a transnational history of, if you like, pluralism. Another example is the extent to which the Baltic Republics after 1920 um, borrowed from the Russian Empire, from the Russian Empire in terms of uh, incorporating legislation about what they called as 
described as cultural, cultural sovereignty thing. So basically, it was another form of feudalization. The claim was that each of the component parts of any given Baltic Republic should be given the same autonomy, which within the Austrian Empire, the various ethnicities and the various language groups and the various whatever they are, uh, were granted at the end, just before the First World War. So there is this circulation of ideas. It's in itself a, a remarkable aspect of the history of imperialism. And you could go back a long time in history. I mean, the first example of toleration within empire is well attested to in the, in the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, and this is how the Persians dealt with their ethnicities. The Persian empire was remarkably tolerant. Why? Because they all realized that the system works much, much better if you allow different people to somehow have their own sphere of influence, provided they're all loyal to the central government in the key areas, in the areas which matter. Which matter. So basically, if you like, this is, a, this is a form of, as you say, divided impera, but it is also largely a way within which the division reflects what people actually expect and would like to have, and then, then is imposed from above from the simple purpose of uh, uh, you know, uh, controlling and fomenting uh, um, conflict. I might ask a question. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for a really fascinating presentation. Um, I was thinking about um, yeah the context of the minorities in the twenties and thirties, forties, the big war period in Ireland, and I just I was reflecting again actually in your response to the questions, particularly in relation to De Valera. It's interesting that the two major minorities, I think, that you're uh, thinking about in Ireland, Jewish community, um, Protestants, sort of end up, um, to the extent that they're integrated into political camps, they end up being integrated into the two different political camps in Ireland. Um, so, by and large, the Jewish community tends to be more associated with Fianna Fáil, um, and by and large, Anglicans, Protestants tend to be more associated with Fianna Gael. Um, and I think that's an expression of how class basically is coming across these minorities. Um, but it also ends up being important, I think, in terms of the, the wider culture around how, how these political parties are relating to each other. So if you do, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know if you have, they have, if you type in Jew or Jewish into the Dáil debates for the 1930s, it's mostly Fine Gael, uh, TDs, like Oliver J. Flanagan shouting very violently anti-Semitic remarks to, and claiming that De Valera is himself uh, crypto-Jewish and so on. Um, so again, a part of that shaping of that discourse. Um, part of the reason why perhaps the Jewish community can become so integrated with Fine Gael, or Fine Paul, is their own very hardcore Zionism, which makes them, I think, legible to nationalists uh, in a way that perhaps uh, Protestants can't quite be. Um, so, I suppose it's a question about um, how this sort of class dimension and uh, other set of dimensions, I suppose the re relationship to the old imperial state as well uh, is a complicating factor really in this question of minorities. I mean, not all minorities are the same and, and they can relate very differently to, to different factions of nationalism. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, class is, a, is a, the elephant in the room in any discussion of Irish history. Uh, but there is a simplifying factor uh, at work during this period, um, which is very much at work, especially for the Protestants, and that's immigration. So Ireland, after partition, found a final solution for poverty, just sending over to America, uh, where they could become millionaires, and so <laughs> somehow uh, they solved themselves. But, um, but also it creates a much more homogeneous society, a society within which um, basically it's the only society in Europe there is no mass working class party or labor party in society in which the two major parties represent different ideas of different traditions in middle class politics and within which of course there is so, so much ambiguity what the two parties stand for so Fine, Fine Gael or rather um, the, the coalition which supported the free state was also the government which had Latino uh, 
elaborated the Constitution of 1922, which was ostensibly more liberal than the one of 1937, only ostensibly. And on the other hand, um, from especially in the aftermath of um, uh, Costello, repeal of the Extended Relations Act, you find Protestants flocking to Fine, Fine Foy, but the movement is started already at Trinity College in the 1930s, partly because uh, Fine Kale was very close to University College Dublin. <laughs> so it was a very strange relationship, meaning which the barriers or the boundaries are not just ideological, they're largely opportunistic and they reflect tactics of uh, realignment uh, which are very uh, responsive to the situation, the opportunities of the moment. Mm. Thank you. Right me the quip about Elizabeth Bowen writing intelligence reports back to London and trying to explain to the British that um, the party that's most emphatically pro-British is the closest to actual fascism and the party that's most violently is, is actually fought with the Spanish, again, with the Republicans in Spain. So, yes. again, enough to explode the brains of some of the countries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please. Thank you. Um, I had the delightful pleasure of having lunch with Eugenio and Ahmed, and uh, he what Eugenio said he would not have a glass of wine, and I think he has earned a glass of wine. <laughs> so why don't we all go downstairs and toast Eugenio and with a glass of wine? Thank you all so much for being here. It was fascinating.